Have you heard? USB Type-C is here to save the day. Hooray! It plugs in this way, plugs in that way. It delivers piles of power and bushels of bandwidth. It's taking the world by storm. All of our consumer electronic design problems are solved. Phew! Okay, maybe not. <laughs> sure, USB Type-C is finally coming into its own and making its way into a whole bunch of designs these days. And yes, it will be great for consumers. But for us engineers, creating designs with USB Type-C capability can be a maze indeed. <laughs> Unless you're a USB Type-C expert, getting lost in all of the pins, voltages, and design requirements can be quite daunting. Does anyone have a USB Type-C map around here somewhere? <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Do you need some USB Type-C design assistance? Yeah, I do too. Fortunately, Sagar Kare from Maxim Integrated is here to help us navigate through the pin requirements, channel configurations, and all of that reversible business that USB Type-C brings to the party, and how the Max 77860 can help make your next USB Type-C design easier than ever before. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Maxim Integrated's Max 77 860. Hi, Sagar. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm glad to be here. So one of the biggest trends in battery charging these days is USB Type-C. And it really seems to be everywhere. But Sagar, how big is it really? And where are we going from here? We have market research data that has been showing consistent growth in the USB Type-C market over at least the last six or seven years. The growth has really been driven by smartphones and tablets, but more recently we've been seeing very sharp uptake in consumer electronics. So these days you have all sorts of devices that are powered by USB Type-C and the growth is really seen in that segment. Okay, so I think people in general have taken USB charging for granted, but we're seeing USB Type-C come into its own in a bunch of different applications, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said just now, the market has really been dominated by the smartphone market. In the last 10, 15 years, smartphones have really picked up and taken off in a big way. And a lot of the USB Type-C growth has come in the smartphone segment. These are typically on the smaller end of the charger sizes that you might find, but they do range between around 15 watts up to around 27 watts or so. The way that chargers are implemented in these devices are really highly integrated power management ICs. And uh, they do a lot more than just charging. And because of the push to minimize the size of uh, the phone and the electronics, you see more and more functions integrated into the same device. But that's not the only place where we've seen USB Type-C devices. We also have the segment of laptops, Ultrabooks or Chromebooks, the really slim type of notebook PCs, which have been using the USB Type-C chargers more recently. And this is a slightly different implementation because the power ratings are much higher. They go anywhere between 45 to 100 watts. But because of the size and the power rating, these chargers are typically implemented with external FETs. And so there's not as much integration in this segment. And finally, we have the big growing segment where you almost have a USB-C port found on any new battery-powered electronics that you can buy. And this is the middle range where the chargers are not as small as maybe the smartphones, but also not as big as the laptops. So they can range between around 15 to 45 watts. And this is the segment where chargers are really built as a standalone function and with a lot of integrated power electronics. This is really the area where we're seeing the fastest growth in the USB Type-C market. 
Okay, so let's dive into the nuts and bolts of a USB Type-C charging architecture. Sure. So I have here a picture of a typical architecture that you might find in any USB Type-C charger. What it really includes are multiple pieces, multiple blocks, which do their own individual function. So you do have a charging device, which is really a dedicated device, which converts from some voltage and current into the battery voltage and current. But even before you get into the power conversion aspect, when you have a Type-C port, there's a little more involved. You need to detect the presence of a port. You need to detect what is the capability, the power capability of the port. And so for those functions, you do have what are called dedicated USB port controllers, where a lot of the complex specification of the USB is translated using firmware or software. And they do that complex determination of what is the capability of each device. So some of that includes, now this is getting a little bit technical, but there's a term called configuration channel that is used in the USB Type-C specification which allows the charger and the adapter to really negotiate what power level they should be operating at. Okay. You may also find cases where the charger also has to support legacy USB adapters. And in that case, you may need to have something called a BC 1.2 or battery charging 1.2 specification from the USB implementation forum. And that is really a set of protocols and software that is used to determine what the charging capability of legacy chargers is. And one thing to note really on this architecture is the USB Type-C port is really supposed to be a cold uh, zero volt port. And what it means is as soon as you plug in both sides of the application, you're not necessarily going to charge automatically. The system needs to do a lot more in order to even begin charging. Sure. Okay, so this seems a bit daunting, Sagar, with so many different pieces to the puzzle. How should I approach it? I like to approach it in a very simple way. So really look at the consumer electronics segment in this case. And let's start really listing out what are the charging requirements. So as batteries start getting used in all sorts of devices, you want one thing, which is standardization, because that always helps when for that one day that you forget your cable, you can easily find it somewhere else or you can buy it at any store. So you do want to have that standardized USB-C charger. You also want it to be compatible with older chargers because, you know, let's face it, USB has been around for a long time and you never know what type of port you might get. A lot of times, you know, designers do face the prospect of writing a lot of software and it's a skill that is not easily found. So for that reason, you know, let's say as a designer, I would prefer to have no software development or as little software development as possible. And then as with most electronics, you know, you want to shrink the size of your system. So find a solution that is really as small as you can get. And then finally, you know, you don't want a solution that really starts draining the battery all the time. So you do want to find something that's efficient, that's very high performance, and that extends your battery life. So when you have all of these considerations, you really have to look no further than Maxim's Max 77860, which is a 3 amp or 3.1 amp charger with USB-C detection. And it also supports legacy chargers with uh, support for BC 1.2 and also proprietary adapters. It does not require any firmware. It can easily be configured using a serial I2C port. And it also comes in a very tiny form factor, 3.9 millimeters by 4 millimeters in size. And of course, it does have a very high efficiency, greater than 93%. It also consumes extremely low quiescent current when in standby, just about 20 microamperes of current. Okay, so how exactly does the Max 77860 fit into the architecture? What exactly does this look like? We can revisit the block diagram of the USB-C architecture, and let's see how it fits in. 
So we saw before we have the charger, we have the BC 1.2 detection block, USB-C configuration channel detection block. And you also have a microcontroller, which essentially controller controls all of the USB port functions or a port controller. What the Mac 77860 does is it replaces really three of those blocks that you can see on the screen. It does include the charger. It's a 3.15 amp charger. It has integrated CC pin detection and also BC 1.2 detection capability. And all of this can be configured using a simple I squared C block. All right, Sagar, what else does it offer? What more does this solution buy me as an engineer? One thing that it does is it has a very high input voltage withstand voltage. Uh, it can withstand up to 14 volts maximum. And it also has the option to drive an external over voltage protection fed. It has a 3.15 amp single cell charger with power path. What that means is if you have to charge a device while at the same time using it, you can do that with the Max 77860. Of course, we talked about the integrated CC pin detection as well as the BC 1.2 detection. It has that integrated with no software involved. It can be configured with I squared C without needing any firmware. It can also do USB on the go with up to 5.1 volts and 1.5 amps of power capability. It also has a built in six channel ADC, which measures the USB bus voltage and current. It can measure the battery voltage and charging current or even the discharging current. It also measures the temperature. And it can report all of this information on the I squared C bus. It also comes with factory shipping mode with a battery disconnect FET. What this means is you can actually physically disconnect the battery from the rest of the circuitry when you're shipping your device for the first time or if it's on the shelf uh, for a long time. The last thing you want is for the customer to buy your product and right out of the box have to charge the device significantly. It also has a safe out LDO, which is available to power any auxiliary circuits, even if there is no battery or if as soon as the USB port is connected. Excellent. Now, I have seen some really cool innovation in this space in the last couple of years. So, Sagar, what's exactly new here? The USB cable, so you can see I have a picture of the old traditional USB charging cable, which is a type A to a micro B cable. And on the right hand side, I have the USB type C cable. So first things pretty clear is that the traditional cable used different connectors for the source and the sink. So the type A typically was used on the source and the micro B connector on the sink side. Whereas when you look at the USB C port, when you look at the USB C cable, it uses the same connector on both ends of the cable. The traditional cable also used a non-reversible connector, either a 4 or 5 pin connector. And the USB-C cable uses a 24 pin reversible connector, which is a nice convenience because you don't have to worry about plugging in your cable the wrong way. And then the traditional USB ports have almost always operated at 5 volts and up to 1.5 amps of current. When you start looking at some of the newer electronics, they are extremely power hungry these days. And so there is a need for faster charging and higher power capability. So the USB type C takes it up a notch and it's able to negotiate a voltage and current level much higher than the traditional voltage or current. It can go as high as 20 volts or up to five amps of current on the bus. And then when you look at the USB type C cable, just looking at it a little closely, you see that it does use the same connector on both ends. The standard rating of the USB cable, the Type-C cable, is 3 amperes. You do have the option to have a 5 amp rating, but those are special Type-C cables which actually have a port controller built into them, and they're called electronically marked cables. But whether it's a 3 amp or a 5 amp cable, all cables must pass USB compliance. Sure. Okay. So. I'm on board with higher power and this reversible business, and this sounds super easy. But Sagar, is it as easy as it sounds? 
you know amelia it is easy and the key word here is that it's easy for the end customer when you look at it from a designer's perspective it is a lot more complicated and i'll explain why let's just start with the reversible plug for example it is so convenient to plug in the cable and get it right the first time instead of having to flip it over every time but in order to get to that point first of all the connector is a lot more comprehensive let's say it's a smaller connector but it does have more pins so instead of a 5 pin traditional usb connector type a or type b we have a 24 pin type c connector and i have a picture of what it looks like on the plug as well as on the receptacle obviously they look very similar but there are some subtle differences and i'm going to go through some of them so first of all it has a lot more power and ground connectors so four v bus and four ground pins on the plug as well as receptacle now this is a big deal because this is really what enables the connector to carry that much more power because you have more pins to do that with uh, usb 3.0 3.1 and onwards you have the actual usb high speed or super speed communication that takes place over dedicated transmit and receive pins and the connector has two pairs of transmit and two pairs of receive pins okay it also has a pair of sideband pins which are used for alternate modes which are primarily have to do with communication not much to do with power or charging it also has the configuration channel pins and one thing you'll notice there's a subtle difference between the plug and the receptacle is that the plug only has a single cc pin whereas the receptacle has cc1 and cc2 then we have the d plus and d minus pins which are really the traditional usb communication pins where all the legacy usb port communication used to occur on d plus and d minus then we also have a vcon pin which uh, is really used for powering uh, an active cable so the port controller inside the cable as soon as you plug it into a source the vcon pin is what supplies power to it and therefore it can negotiate power levels and current levels okay so sagar how exactly does the reversible aspect of this work let's look at that into more detail because it is a little bit complicated but hopefully this will explain it very easily so first thing we will look at is the pins on the outer ends of the connectors so we're talking about the eight pins on the top of the screen as well as eight pins on the bottom of the screen one thing you'll notice is the pins are symmetrical in both rows of the connector so if you look at the top left pin it is a ground pin and then the top right pin is also a ground pin so if you reverse the connector you'll still have the ground pins connected no matter what same thing with the transmit and receive pins as well as the v bus pin so because of this symmetry the orientation does not matter the same pins and the same functions get connected when it comes to the middle eight pins it's a slightly different story one thing you'll recall is there is only one cc pin on the plug whereas there are two cc pins cc1 and cc2 on the receptacle in the configuration or in the orientation shown on the screen you have the cc pin on the plug connecting to the cc1 pin on the receptacle and likewise you have the vcon pin on the plug connecting to the cc2 pin on the receptacle one additional thing you should notice is that the d plus and d minus pins have a single pair on the plug whereas there are two pairs of d plus and d minus pins on the receptacle so let's take a look at how the connections are made once the plug is reversed now that the plug is in the reverse orientation you'll notice that the vcon pin on the plug is connected to cc1 on the receptacle and the cc pin on the plug is connected to cc2 on the receptacle with the d plus and d minus pins you'll notice that the d plus and d minus pins on the plug now connect to the outer pair of the d plus and d minus pins on the receptacle you can see that the vcon and cc pins have changed positions the cc pins or cc1 and cc2 pins on the receptacle have a very very specific function that's built into the max 77860 and i'll explain how the detection of that orientation happens on the ic now that you've seen that the cc pin connects to either cc1 or cc2 
Let's take a look at the actual construction of the adapter, the cable, as well as the application with the charger inside. So first thing you'll notice is inside the cable, there is only a single CC pin that goes across from one end to the other. The second thing you'll notice is that the USB adapter has a pair of pull-up resistors inside them. So one end of the CC line on the adapter side is connected to a pull-up and then the other end goes into the CC1 or CC2 pin of the Max 77860. The CC detection block inside the Max 77860 monitors the voltage on both the CC1 as well as CC2 lines. In this case, you see that the CC1 pin is connected to the CC line in the cable and is pulled up in the power adapter. So the voltage measured on CC1 will be within a certain range defined by the USB specification. And then the voltage on CC2, as you can see, there's a pull down resistor inside the cable. So the voltage will be measured different from CC1. Both of these voltages need to be within the specs. So the, the values used for RA and RP are very, very critical in this particular case. So once the voltages are measured, and they're found to be within the right ranges for the cable orientation. The MAX77860 determines that the CC line is connected to the CC1 pin on the charger. Okay, Saga, this is great if you have a C to C cable, but I've seen cables with different connectors on each end. So what's that all about? There are many flavors of the USB type C cable, and there's many reasons for it. Number one is, with the legacy type A ports that have been in use for many, many years, people have really grown to get used to them. Second, not everybody really needs the full power rating that a type C cable offers. So in order to save cost and really not implement a brand new adapter for the charger, people like to continue using a type C port on the adapter side but they do like the convenience of having the reversible plug on the application side. And so there's all sorts of flavors of the cable that are available today. So you could have a type A or a type C on the adapter or source side, but on the sync side, you can have either a type B, traditional type B like a printer cable, or you could have a type C cable connector. You could also have a micro B or a mini B. It comes in any flavor that you want. You can mix and match. What happens in this particular case is that any USB Type-C charger also needs to be backward compatible with a legacy port. So what I've shown here is an example where you might have a legacy Type-A adapter being used with an application which has a Type-C receptacle on it. When you have this type of configuration, the D plus and D minus pins on the USB cable are connected to the DP and DN pins on the MAX77860. These pins are connected to the BC1.2 detection block inside the IC. The way this legacy port detection works is by communicating over the D plus and D minus lines to negotiate the voltage and current levels. So the MAX77860, whether you use a Type-C adapter or a Type-A adapter, will be able to detect the port without any problems. Cool, okay. And here's just a, a list of all the different types of legacy adapters that Max 77860 supports. As you can see, it's a long history. So there have been a lot of different types of USB ports, as well as uh, proprietary adapters that have been developed over the years. And Max 77860 supports a wide variety of them. Okay, this is great, but there's even more cool stuff under the hood in the Max 77860, right, Zagar? You're absolutely right, Amelia. So we already looked at some of the features, but you should also know that the Max 77860 has the capability to withstand up to 14 volts of input voltage. It also has the capability to control or to drive an external over-voltage FET. It has adaptive current limiting. So for example, if you have a really cheap and dirty power adapter, which is not quite capable of delivering the power that it states on the label, then the MAX77860 is smart enough to recognize that. How does it do that? It has this adaptive input current limiting function. 
What it means is if the adapter is somehow not able to deliver the rated current that it advertised, then the MAX77860 will automatically reduce the current it pulls from that adapter. And it keeps doing that until the VBUS comes back into the regulation voltage range. And so even if you have a really cheap and dirty adapter, MAX77860 will be able to handle that without any unexpected disconnections or crashes from the charger. It also has a power path with an integrated disconnect FET. What that means is if you wanted to charge your device at the same time as you were using it, you can actually do that because the IC has the bypass path where you can power all the electronics on your circuit and also deliver current into the battery at the same time. So that is sometimes you, you have devices which can either be charged or be used without the charger, but you can't do both. So the MAX77860 will make sure that you can do both at the same time. We talked about the 3.15 amp charging capability of the MAX77860, but it also has up to 9 amps of discharging capability. So if you have a device that is especially power hungry, or if you have times where it needs to consume a lot more current than it's rated for, then for short durations, the MAX77860 is able to provide that current without shutting off because of an overcurrent condition. It also has the integrated battery disconnect fed, which means if you're shipping the device or if it's sitting on the shelf for a long time, the battery doesn't automatically drain very quickly. It also has the capability to detect a dead battery. So if you have a situation where the battery was completely drained out, a lot of times the battery needs to be charged very slowly in the beginning for its voltage to be brought up to the permissible range to start fast charging. So the MAX77860 automatically detects if it's a dead battery and it goes into a pre-qualification state for charging. And then once it reaches a certain level of voltage where fast charging is allowed, then it switches to the fast charging mode all by itself without any external interference. On the USB port side, we already talked about the integrated CC pin detection as well as the BC 1.2, as well as proprietary adapter detection. It also has the USB on the go capability which means if you have a device that is used to power or to charge an accessory, like a stylus or something like that, you could use your device to charge any smaller accessory up to 5 volts and 1.5 amps power. There is no firmware required. The MAX77860 is fully configurable through a simple I2C interface. It has a factory ship mode with a dedicated on-key pin which allows the charger to be turned on with the use of a simple push button. It also has the six channel ADC, which monitors voltage, current, and die temperature, and it can report that information over the I2C bus. If you have a fault in your system, which prevents the battery from getting charged up to 100%, then we also have a watchdog timer built into the MAX77860, which will limit how much time the battery can be charged so that is a way of protecting the battery because you cannot just keep charging it for an extended duration. It also has built-in thermal protection and shutdown capability. So if the temperature goes outside the operating range, then the MAX77860 will shut down automatically. And last but not least, it also comes in a really tiny package. It's a 3.9 millimeter by 4 millimeter size, which is really critical for most battery-powered applications these days. All right, Sagar, if I want even more information about the MAX 77860, what kind of resources do you guys have available? You can always visit the website and find all sorts of product information, including the data sheet. We also have an EV kit, which helps users or helps designers to bring it up to speed or get up to speed very quickly on the device using a very simple graphical user interface. We also have a lot of learning resources such as application notes and tutorials that are available for users to download and read at their leisure. All right. Well, that was super cool. And I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Sagar. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find a whole lot more information about the Max 77 860 from Maxim Integrated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. 
For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.